Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel MacArthur. I'm the co-director of the Medical and Population Genetics Program here at the Broad. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural talk of the 2017 Midsummer Nights Science Lectures. Tonight's talk by David is particularly special. Um, I'm honoured to announce that this evening has been named the Eliana Hector Memorial Lecture. Uh, this is named in honour of Eliana, a, a, a wonderfully gifted MD-PhD student and a treasured member of the Broad community who we lost tragically in 2014. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank her father, Michael Hector, uh, and her partner, Jacob Lurie, who are both with us here this evening. Thank, thank, and to, to thank them both for funding this evening's lecture. Um, I'd like to say, start by saying a few things about this incredibly gifted young woman, Eliana. Uh, she graduated magna cum laude at the age of 18 from the University of Washington uh, in 2006 with a degree in mathematics. Uh, she went on to become the second youngest Rhodes Scholar in history and then continued her studies in medical school uh, in the Health Sciences and Technology program at Harvard and MIT. El Eliana was many things. She, among them, she was a gifted writer. Uh, she studied creative writing with the university's honours program in Rome, and her short story, Extremities, was published posthumously in the eminent literary journal Plowshares. Uh, as is very fitting for this particular lecture series, she believed incredibly passionately in communicating the excitement, the wonder, and the joy of science and mathematics to people who are neither scientists nor mathematicians. And you'll hear, I, I hope you'll get some of that infectious enthusiasm uh, from tonight's speaker as well. Eliana was, in her scientific career, a beloved member of the Broad's uh, Medical and Population Genetics Program. Uh, this is a program which is focused on understanding how variation in human genomes influences many different human traits, including the risk of disease. And I know that she would have loved to hear about the work of tonight's speaker, David Reich. So let me introduce David. Uh, David is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. He's also a senior associate member here at the Broad and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, David is a world-renowned pioneer in the analysis of the DNA of ancient humans. Uh, and you'll hear tonight about many of the cutting edge techniques that his team has, has helped to develop to extract and sequence DNA from ancient bones and then to reshape our understanding of human evolution and migration. Uh, in short, David and his, and his group have allowed us to rewrite uh, much about what we understand about the narrative arc of human history. In the last few years alone, uh, David and his team and his collaborators have used a whole variety of different ancient DNA analysis techniques to reveal how Neanderthals interbred with humans, to identify the ancestors of present day Europeans, to trace migrations into the Americas, reveal the imprint of the dawn of agriculture on human genomes, and also to understand the roots of Indo-European languages. For his work, David has been awarded many outstanding awards, including the Genzyme Outstanding Achievement in Biomedical Research Award in 2007, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize from AAAS in 2010, and the prestigious Dan David Prize in 2017. In 2015, Nature named him as one of the 10 people who matter in science for his contribution in turning ancient DNA uh, from a niche pursuit into an industrial practice. So we're looking forward to hearing more about the way in which David has impacted the study of ancient humans. And please join me in welcoming him to the stage. It's um, a pleasure to talk to the, uh, to the community here in Boston about the research I've been doing um, on human history and genetic data. Um, so um, the title of my talk is Who We Are and How We Got Here, The Ancient DNA Revolution and the New Science of the Human Past. And I'm going to try to talk about, communicate something about the power and potential of this new technology um, and um, how really new it is and how it's revealing things we never knew about before. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to talk about um, the ancient DNA revolution and the uh, newfound ability just in the last two years to generate data from very large numbers of individuals. Um, I'm going to then talk about, um, as an example of some, one of the research strands that's emerged from this that I've been involved in, insights into the genetic formation of West Eurasian human populations. That includes Europe and the Near East and uh, parts of the steppe um, uh, in the last few years. And then I'm going to also talk about challenges as we move toward the present in this rapidly changing field. So ancient DNA is a new scientific instrument which really came and became available beginning around 2010. It's very, very new. In 2010, the first genome-wide human DNA was ancient DNA was published. Um, it was uh, four sequence, three sequences from a Neanderthal, uh, from three different Neanderthal individuals, one sequence from a new archaic human that was not known before the DNA, a Denisovan and another sequence from a 4,000-year-old Greenlander were published in that year. It was a very exciting year. 
Um, and um, it made it possible to look at the, gene the genetic variation in these ancient people and to compare them to each other and to people living today. Um, and I think that the significance of this is really profound because every time we got a new sequence as a community from these ancient individuals and, was, and we were able to compare it to people living today, we found things that we had not known about before, almost every time. And this is the mark of a scientific instrument that allows one to visualize and to see into a world one never saw before, kind of like the telescope when it was first discovered. You can look into the stars and see planets that were not known about before, or the microscope, you could look at cells and realize there were cells, there were things that you didn't know about before in the world. And almost every time we look at a new time period, a new culture with ancient DNA, everything is new, everything is a surprise. And it's the mark of probing a space that hasn't been probed before. And this is what we are involved in as a community right now. It's a very exciting time. So the way ancient DNA and genome-wide ancient DNA works is we start with a skeletal remain, perhaps a bone, um, that is taken from an ancient human or, an, or, or another animal or a plant. Um, in a clean room, um, we have two clean rooms here in Boston, and uh, which is meant to protect the sample from the people who are handling it. So here, it's opposite of a, of a virology laboratory where you're trying to protect the researcher from the sample. Here, you're trying to protect the sample from the researcher. So instead of being under negative pressure, the room is under positive pressure, for example, to protect the samples from the DNA all floating around that might contaminate the sample because there's so little DNA in the bones and there's so much DNA in the person handling it that it can easily <laughs> be contaminated. Uh, we drill beneath the surface of the bone, as in this image, um, and try, or drill, drill beneath it to try to get away from the contamination that might be on its surface from people heart handling the bone. We obtained a little bit of powder, typically 70 milligrams would be our optimal amount of powder. We dissolve it in a chemical solution which will remove the protein and mineral content um, and will hopefully isolate the DNA that we then turn into a sequenceable form using one of the ever more efficient chemical reaction series that are, have been developed in order to get as much DNA as possible out of this, uh, out of ancient remains. And then we sequence it on one of these modern sequencers that produce literally hundreds of thousands of times more data for, per unit of currency than was the case 15 years ago. And so we really can generate substantial amounts of DNA despite the often vanishingly small quantities of DNA in, in these, these samples. So beginning in 2010, as I mentioned, people were working very hard on these ancient archaic humans, Neanderthals and other archaic humans, as well as early modern humans. And this was a very exciting period, and people in the laboratories that developed this, especially uh, Svante Pebo's laboratory in Leipzig in Germany, would spend a long period of time, years and years and years, screening many dozens of ancient Neanderthal bones, and almost all of them were empty of DNA or so contaminated as to be useless. But after all this hard work and screening, they would sometimes find a bone that had DNA in it, and that would be what we would often in the community call a golden sample, and then the whole team would turn to working on the sample and to produce enough DNA to analyze. And that was the paradigm in DNA um, analysis of ancient genomes. Um, and the way I, I was involved in the um, collaboration led by Svante Pebo in Leipzig, studying the Neanderthal and other archaic genomes, and learned a tremendous amount from them. But it seemed to me that in, if we were moving toward the present, say toward the last 10,000 years, the success rates might be much higher than it was the case, than, than would be the case for Neanderthals. And uh, maybe we wouldn't need to look for a golden sample. We could expect that a large fraction of the samples analyzed would convert to working DNA. And we should think about how to generate substantial numbers of samples, because with substantial numbers of samples, we can ask and answer kinds of questions which might not be possible to answer as easily from one or two amazing samples. And so that was the approach that I focused on. And we started an ancient laboratory, DNA laboratory here in Boston in 2013 with the help of our colleagues in Leipzig focused on trying to realize this vision of industrial scale ancient DNA. I, I did a postdoc here with Eric Lander um, as uh, where we were focusing on genomics, making things efficient, making things large scale. Um, and that's often done in medical genetics. And I spent a long period of my uh, beginning of my faculty position working on large scale medical genetics. And um, I've I, that's very, and still work on that to some extent, and that's very much part of my perspective. So I tried to wed that with the ancient DNA world and see if we can make ancient DNA large scale. 
So the focus in my laboratory was trying to find a way where we could efficiently, for a reasonable cost, screen each sample. And the problem with ancient DNA is that it's very expensive because so little of it is human. So even when you get the DNA, most of the material you get is typically microbial. It's from the fungi and bacteria that, uh, that colonized the skeletal remain after the individual died. And um, that's one big challenge. Um, and the solution that we developed for this, uh, working again with our colleagues in Leipzig, was to enrich the, the sample the, for positions that were um, for, for positions that we knew were informative in the human genome. So we use techniques similar to the techniques used for what's called exome sequencing. So exome sequencing is the 2%, aims at the 2% of our genome that codes for genes. And what, what, for example, is often done here at the Broad Institute and many other places, is one washes one sample, one's prepared DNA, over a, a, a set of chemical baits that are in solution that stick to just that 2% of the genome one's interested in, and then you only sequence those part that stuck to the baits. And so instead of sequencing the whole genome, you could just sequence the 2% you're interested in. So we took the same approach for ancient DNA, where we took about 1.2 million baits that targeted known positions that are informative to be about human variation, that are variable amongst people. And we targeted those, and then we washed the ancient DNA sample. And instead of 0.1% of the DNA being human, 25% uh, of it was human, and not only that, it was at informative positions in the genome. So suddenly, the amount of sequencing to generate genome-wide data of very high quality that can permit studies of human variation was um, 50 times, 100 times, 200 times less than it was before. And samples that had so little DNA were accessible before to be inaccessible were suddenly accessible. And so the amount of sequencing required to generate genome-wide data from an ancient sample is really smaller than the cost of time to prepare the sample now. So the result of this um, innovation and innovations in other laboratories over the last few years has been to create a very rapid expansion amount of ancient DNA. This is a picture of a chart of Moore's law, which shows the doubling of the density of elements on integrated circuits every one to two years over the last three quarters of a century, which has driven the computer revolution. And the increase in ancient DNA has been even more rapid. As I mentioned, in 2010, there were a few genomes, and that trickle continued until 2013, when it then took off. Um, it took off in 2015 with a series of papers, um, many of them based on this in-solution enrichment approach I described to you. And in our laboratory right now, we have about 2,700 working samples, um, most of them unpublished because the data is now accumulating so fast that it's accumulating faster than we can publish it. And I'm sure this is true also of other laboratories. So this puts us as a community into a new space of information where we can ask and answer questions about the past that couldn't be answered before. Now, these 2,700 samples in our laboratory are not from all over the world. They're heavily biased. They're very Eurocentric, more from Europe than from elsewhere. But they are diverse around the world, and they are from many cultures, and they're allowing us and others to ask and answer questions that couldn't be answered before. So there's a great cost reduction in quality improvement, as I mentioned, rel relative to methods that just brute force try to sequence these samples. Here's an results from an amazing study where, um, where uh, that was published two years ago in 2015, where about 100 samples were sequenced, um, and they obtained about, on average, of about 20% of the positions in the genome were analyzed. Um, and the amount of the approximate cost per genome was about $8,000 of sequencing because it was so expensive. But with this technology, here's 160 samples published in that year. It's maybe only $80 per sample, um, and, or, um, and the coverage and the average coverage is higher. So it really is a revolutionary technology that permits large-scale analysis. OK, now I'm going to move to what one can begin to learn. So my entry into genome-wide studies of, of human history was in my PhD. I did my PhD um, at, um, I did my PhD uh, at Oxford, I think, where Eliana was as well. And um, my hero from the very beginning was uh, Luca Cavalli-Sforza, who's my academic grandfather, my supervisor's supervisor. So Luca Cavalli-Sforza is a very famous Italian-American geneticist who or Italian geneticist who did his, much of his major work in Stanford. 
Um, and he made a bet in 1960 that it would be possible to reconstruct the deep history of humans based on present day population structure and reported a whole series of brilliant um, analyses uh, that uh, analyzed the type of data he had available to him at the time, mostly based on variation in blood groups like the ABO polymorphisms and so on, to try to see the migrations and look at the differences amongst human populations and reconstruct migrations. And his bet was that if you go back 500 years before transatlantic travel, before the big mixtures that have produced African Americans and Latinos, things would have been simpler that populations at the time would descend directly from the first human populations that got there, and that we could reconstruct the past from the traces it's left behind the, in the present. And what ancient DNA has shown us just in the last few years is that that bet is wrong, that in fact human populations have moved around again and again and again and mixed so much that it's impossible to see very clearly what happened more than a few thousand years ago from the patterns of people today, and that we really need this direct look at the past that comes from sequencing ancient genomes to be able to do that. So I'm going to tell you a story in a number of chapters about what we have learned in the last few years, just a snippet of what we've learned in the last few years from ancient whole genomes about the formation of West Eurasian populations. There's a number of other amazing things that have been learned from ancient genomes in this space of learning about West Eurasian populations, as well as about things I'm not going to tell you about, the interactions of archaic and modern humans, the peopling of the Americas, population movements in the Americas, population movements in the Pacific, population movements and replacements in East Asia and Africa. I'm not going to tell you about those. So, um, so um, I'm going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to talk about the genomic history of Ice Age Europe and what we know about that, which is, is not enough right now. So I'm just sort of going to first give you a sense of the timeline. So modern humans expand out of Africa and the Near East beginning about 50,000 years ago into uh, an environment which was not empty of humans, but in fact there were humans already there, but they were mostly archaic humans, archaic humans like Neanderthals, and we now know Denisovans and other archaic humans who were in different parts of Eurasia at the time, but not yet in the Americas. So modern humans, people who are anatomically like us, um, expanded into Europe in particular beginning at least 47,000 years ago, um, as documented by the very dramatic change in archaeological uh, ty uh, uh, remains that is, appears at that time, where Neanderthal-type stone tools give way to modern humans. Neanderthals were uh, fully as big-brained as us, as us and made sophisticated tools, but they were just different. And they disappeared quite quickly after interacting with modern humans within a few thousand years. So what we did in 2016 is we published a paper where we assembled DNA from 51 uh, ancient humans, uh, mostly from Europe, ranging in time from 45,000 years ago from, to 7,000 years ago. And we tried to learn what we could about how these populations transformed over time. So this is a map of where these samples come from, which, uh, with the height corresponding to the age of the sample, and the color coding corresponding to the genetic cluster that we observed. So I'm going to go through these results a little bit. And I'm not going to, I don't have time in this talk to explain to you the details of the argumentation, although I'll try to refer and gesture at it sometimes. So the first thing that we did was we tried to estimate the ama amount of Neanderthal admixture, these archaic humans who were in Eurasia, in these samples. Now, Neanderthals, it was, there was a question before 2010 about whether Neanderthals and modern humans interbred, and the thought was probably that they hadn't based on the genetic data that existed prior to that time. But in 2010, um, we and others compared the new Neanderthal genomes that we were sequencing to diverse modern humans, and it was clear that Neanderthals were a little bit more closely related to non-Africans than to Africans, but it was a highly significant effect, and multiple lines of evidence showed that it could only be explained by archaic Neanderthal interbreeding with modern humans at the gateway of Africa as modern humans expanded out. We can estimate by estimating how far of the way toward a complete Neanderthal with regard to the amount of similarity to the Neanderthal genome we analyzed any modern human was, that it was about 2% of the ancestry of modern humans in Eurasia derives from Neanderthals. And so we applied this technique of, of estimating how far of the way, how much of the way toward 100% Neanderthal or different ancient humans to estimate how that's changed over time. And what we saw was a really dramatic pattern in these ancient samples where there's a decline in Neanderthal ancestry over time, beginning with the 45,000-year-old sample where it's about 5% down to the present level of about 
So there's two things in this picture I wanted to highlight for you. One is this outlier over here, Oasa. So this is a 40,000-year-old individual from Romania. Um, and this individual had about 9% Neanderthal ancestry. And this individual had chunks of their genome that were absolutely huge and that were entirely matching Neanderthals that were unbroken by the meiotic process that occurs when you produce a sperm and an egg and meant that this individual had a Neanderthal direct ancestor four to six generations back, back in its family tree. So with this individual, we caught an individual who was actually very close to some of the interbreeding that occurred. But this individual is more of an anomaly because most of these individuals are descended from what is probably an earlier interbreeding event than 40,000 years ago that most likely occurred in the Near East where modern humans and Neanderthals perhaps first met. And what we see is a decline over time, and we now know that this is due to natural selection that removed Neanderthal ancestry on average from the modern human genome. On average, Neanderthal material was slightly bad for modern humans, not as good for us as genetic data inherited from modern humans, um, perhaps because Neanderthals lived in a small population for a long period of time and built up a lot of slightly bad mutations that were then removed by the action of natural selection after the intermixture occurred. So you see the effects of this over time. It's also clear from other aspects of the data that the Neanderthals and modern humans, when they met, were at the edge of biological incompatibility. It's quite clear from the genetic patterns, including the absence of Neanderthal ancestry on the X chromosome and the uh, absence of Neanderthal ancestry in male germline expressed genes like testis, that uh, the males, males were likely to be relatively infertile of the offspring, and there was natural selection rapidly to remove some of these problems in the population. So what we're seeing is the action of natural selection over time. We're not seeing dilution of Neanderthal ancestry. You can actually really see it's natural selection. Neanderthal ancestry is depleted near genes, um, which is a sure sign of natural selection. This is not dilution by groups without Neanderthal ancestry. So going back to these 51 individuals, we clustered them based on their genetic similarity to each other, and we found a few big clusters of genetically similar individuals. There was, we named them after the oldest sample for which we had very high quality data. And there was a cluster over here. You see this bright square in the heat map where there's a lot of individuals who are genetically share a lot of mutations with each other. We called it the Vestanitia cluster, because, and it corresponds very strongly to an archaeological culture that spread over Europe between about 33 and 25,000 years ago called the Gravedian, and it was associated with these very dramatic Venus figurines and a lot of other amazing, beautiful artifacts and cave art, such as you actually see when you see some of these pictures of cave art. A lot of it was made by these Gravedians. Another cluster, which we call the Elmiron cluster, which first starts with the 19,000, it's this cluster of closely related individuals, which first starts with a 19,000 year old individual from Spain and then spreads into Central Europe following the retreating ice sheets. Um, and these are people who repeopled Europe after the Ice Age. So the Ice Age had its maximum between about 26,000 and 18,000 years ago. And then as it got warmer, people started following the retreating glaciers north. And these Magdalenians, which is the archaeological culture that strongly correlated to the Elmiron cluster, were following this, these retreating gla glaciers from the southwest, from Iberia, and repeopling northern Europe. And the last cluster is called the Villa Bruna cluster. It's this large square over here. And these individuals um, are, appear earliest in our data 14,000 years ago um, and are the people who were primarily the ones who were encountered by farmers as they arrived in Europe about 8,000 years ago. So what happened in our samples that we uh, analyzed? So beginning about uh, these, with these two samples, Kostenki, which is a sample from Eastern Europe, and Goyer, which is a sample from Belgium in Western Europe, we begin to see samples that genetically are similar to present-day Europeans. So there's already populations that share some history and some mutations with present-day Europeans more than they do East Asians by, about 30, by at least 37,000 years ago. But they already split into two deeply divergent branches. This one over here is archaeologically associated with a culture called the Aurignacian, which is the first widespread culture of modern humans defined by the archaeology in Central and Western Europe, and is replaced archaeologically by the Gravedian, which are actually much more closely related to this Eastern sample. And they spread, including to the site, to the same cave where this Belgian Aurignacian individual is, and they're genetically very different. So we see this population get replaced by groups that are more like the Eastern group, beginning about 33,000 years ago. And they spread all over Europe, from, oops, from Western Europe 
They spread all over Europe, from Western Europe uh, to Southern Italy, everywhere, these Gravettians. They're very successful. Then we haven't sampled individual from a period called the Salutrian, which is an important period during the Ice Age. And then we sample again from the Elmiron cluster over here, which has a heavy proportion of ancestry from the Aurignacians, who seem to have disappeared for 19,000 years, but they come back. So they were obviously hiding out in some pocket, maybe in Western Europe. And then they, there's a resurgence of them in this repeopling from the Southwest. And they then become the dominant population, these lost population of Western Europe. And then beginning 14,000 years ago, um, this Villa Bruna cluster arrives, which is again quite different, and again from a different position in the, in the tree of relationships. And, um, and it actually replaces also the uh, Elmiron clusters from Western Europe. Um, so you see this back and forth wave of population replacements. Um, is that a fire alarm? <laughs> what? I see. <laughs> Are we okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So when the when the wave comes in, um, we can. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm running up the stairs that way. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Um, so, so, so the Villa Bruna cluster arrives and actually replaces again this Elmiron cluster largely in Western Europe um, and goes all the way to, to, to Spain. So what's happening? So there's these multiple replacements, this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. And so what's happening? So I want to focus in particular on what happens with this 14,000 year old Villa Bruna cluster. If you measure how similar the Villa Bruna cluster sample is using one of those early Europeans as a reference, to, um, to uh, so you take an early Europeans like that Eastern European one that I mentioned at the beginning, and you say, is that early European more closely is is that early European um, more closely sorry is 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 a present day population from for example the Near East more closely related to an early European or a late European? They're all hovering around zero until about fourteen thousand years ago, without any closer proximity to the early Europeans than to the later Europeans consistent with the idea that Europeans are just a continuous population for a period of at least 20,000 years. But suddenly after 14,000 years ago, especially in the Near East, there's a much stronger proximity of Near Easterners to the ones after 14,000 years ago. Um, and the interpretation of that that we have is that there's a drawing together of the genetic patterns in the Near East and Europe after 14,000 years ago. And one possible explanation for that, although we don't yet have any ancient DNA of this age from the Near East, is that after the Ice Age, not just was there a repeopling from Iberia from the southwest of Europe, but also there was a repeopling from the southeast of Europe, from the Balkans, or maybe from even Western Asia, Anatolia, and it migrated both into Europe and also perhaps into Asia, pulling together these populations of Europe and the Near East thousands of years before the arrival of farming. So this is an unknown movement of people from the southeast, possibly even from the Near East into Europe prior to the farming migration, which later occurred. So the summary is that there's an initial pioneer populations in Europe, like this Owasa individual that interacted with Neanderthals, but did not contribute substantially to later modern humans in the region. It went extinct um, after the spread of groups like uh, this Aurignacian individual and this Eastern European one. Then there was this Gravedian or Festonitsa population that overspreads Europe and dominates for many thousands of years and is associated with an archeological efflorescence. There's a resurfacing of this early European lineage from Western Europe that seems to have been marginalized but resurfaced probably from Iberia beginning 19,000 years ago. And then beginning 14,000 years ago, there's a wave back from the east that then largely replaces this Western wave. Um, and that 14,000 years ago corresponds to a time called the Balling Alarode. It's the first intense warming period after the Ice Age. It's when the ice dam breaks between Western and Eastern Europe. There's all sorts of animal exchanges between Western and Eastern Europe, and it seems that humans exchange too at this time. This ice dam went all the way down to the Mediterranean around where Nice is today, and it broke, and it permitted an exchange of people and plants and animals. So chapter two of this part of my talk um, is about the genomic impact of the arrival of farming. So farming is arguably the greatest cultural and lifestyle transition that has ever happened to our species. It begins for the first time in world history, probably in the Near East, about 11 and a half thousand 
Hello. It begins, it begins 11 and a half thousand years ago in the Near East, um, in, uh, uh, probably in the northern part of the Fertile Crescent, southeastern uh, Turkey, um, or, northeast, or northern Syria, um, and possibly almost around the same time in Iran, in the western Iran. So we succeeded last year at getting genome-wide data from 44 ancient Near Easterners close to this time of the farming revolution from the whole span from uh, Anatolia, from Turkey, although Western Anatolia, not the Eastern Anatolians, where it really was the heart of the revolution, from Southwestern Near East, from Israel and Jordan, um, also from, the West, from Iran, from the cradle of agriculture in Iran, and um, also from Armenia, which is just south of the Caucasus Mountains. So it was very exciting to have this data, and it was be permitted by a new technical improvement that was, uh, arose in 2015, which was on top of these enrich enrichment procedures, the community discovered, especially a person named Ron Pinhasi, that it's possible to uh, pick which skeletal parts of the body you look at, and there's one skeletal part, which is the petrous bone, which is a piece of your temporal bone at the side of your skull that carries your inner ear, and it's in fact the cochlea of the inner ear. It contains literally 100 times more DNA than any other tissue anybody have ever looked at, and it made success with difficult samples like from the Near East, where there's a lot of heat, um, uh, heat that degrades DNA possible for the first time. So here's a picture that we stare at a lot in our laboratory a lot. So these gray dots um, are, uh, in the background, are present day um, people. It's about 1,000 present day people from Europe and the Near East. And this is a principal component analysis. So briefly, what's done here is the type of data we're looking at is about 600,000 positions across the genome where people are variable, where some people have, for example, an adenine in the four bases of DNA, and the other people might have a cytosine. Um, another type of base of DNA. And so you should think of the data as a matrix, a, a rectangular matrix with 600,000 rows corresponding to all the 600,000 positions we're looking at, and about 1,000 columns corresponding to all the 1,000 people we're looking at. And in each part of the matrix, you get a 0, 1, or 2, comparing, de depending on whether you have two A's, an A and a C, or two C's, two adenines, an adenine, and a cytosine, or two cytosines. You multiply the matrix by itself to see how similar each sample is to another, and you get a 1,000 by 1,000 square matrix showing how similar each sample is to every other sample. And you perform a mathematical transformation called principal component analysis that tries to automatically separate the samples based on which are most similar to each other. The first principal component, which is on the x-axis here, describes the most variation amongst the samples, and the second principal component, the second most variation. And there's a third and a fourth and a fifth, but you can't show them on a two-dimensional plot. Um, and what you see, and when you do principal components analysis of West Eurasian populations, is a really remarkable pattern, which is two parallel lines with a gap in between where there's relatively few samples. This line corresponds to Near Easterners. Here's Arabians in the south. Here are Iranians and Armenians in the north. These populations are Southern Europeans, especially Sardinians and Iberians, and there's Northeastern Europeans over here. And there's a gap in between, which today is filled by some Jewish populations and Greek populations and island Mediterranean populations that have plausibly more recent interactions between the Near East and Europe. And the interpretation of this is that Europeans today are a mixture of European hunter-gatherers that we now have ancient <coughs> DNA from and people like this, and Europeans today fall in the middle. And everybody in, European, in Europe has hunter-gatherer ancestry admixed into them from the um, ancient Europeans who lived there but who no longer exist in unmixed form. There's other features. That's the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is something really special that I will tell you about soon. <clears throat> so um, one thing I wanted to sort of first tell you about in the Near Eastern work is we now have data from all across the ancient samples from all across this region, and we've found that the genetic variation seen in West Eurasia today can largely be described, at least in our current modeling, as mixtures of four source populations. Uh, the European hunter-gatherers, um, who are over here beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East, the Anatolian farmers, the Levantine farmers, and steppe uh, and Iranian populations. <clears throat> 
So there's different ways to look at this, but the level of differentiation amongst these four source populations for Europeans is around 0.01 on a scale of squared frequency difference, where you look, measure the frequency differences between pairs of populations. And that's the level of differentiation that exists today between Europeans and East Asians. So this is a really striking observation. It's telling you that 10,000 years ago when these groups existed in Europe, and we have ancient DNA from them, there were four groups in Europe and the Near East, each is differentiated from each other as Europeans and East Asians are today. So today, West Eurasians are much of a muchness. They've been called Caucasians, for example, and people have called them a race, for example. But this time in the past, 10,000 years ago, there were genetically at least four groups as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians. And these weren't just shallow differences. These were deep differences reflecting tens of thousands of years of separation. And so if you were to go back in time and categorize the population structure of the world as it existed 10,000 years ago, they would be as different as they are today, but the differences would be not fall along the same lines. They would be profoundly different. You would not recognize the human population structure of the world today. It would be very profoundly different. So what's very exciting is you can watch how the population structure in West Eurasia, which today has very little differentiation, um, all the way from Central Asia and Iran, all the way to the Atlantic shores of Europe, and watch how it changes over time from 0.1 down to 0.01. And you see the West Eurasian genetic variation and differentiation collapses over this period so that by the Bronze Age, by four or 5,000 years ago, it was similar to today. And what actually happened is the following. So here's these four source populations. Um, which are represented here by solid bars um, in 100% ancestry from each of these sources. And the populations later are mixtures of them. It's not as if one displaced the other, which seems to have largely happened amongst, in Ice Age Europe in many cases. It's rather they mixed to each other in different, and they mixed in each other and they homogenized through mixing, kind of like you mix ingredients for a cake. Um, and today, the low differentiation of West Eurasians today is not due to one group replacing the others, but rather mixture. So for example, the farmers from Anatolia, from Western Turkey and Turkey, spread into Europe and mixed with the hunter-gatherers there. They also went, spread east and mixed with the Iranian farmers. The Iranian farmers spread, uh, spread east into India, but they also spread west into the Near East. And you see all these populations merging out of the mixtures. They were all expanding, all admixing in different proportions and in very particular, specific, interesting ways. So this is an attempt to diagram that, whereas over time, there was a coming together of these groups. So chapter three of what I wanted to talk to you about was to move to Europe in particular. And this is where we have our best data in ancient DNA right now. And Europe is very interesting in terms of its deep structure in the last 10,000 years because there's two non-genetic pieces of information. There are many non-genetic pieces of information, but that are particularly striking and you should know about. One of them is the spread of farming. So farming first arrives is in the Near East. Um, as I said, about 11,500 years ago, as shown in this contour plot, and spreads into Europe, arriving in the remotest reaches of arable Europe by about 6,000 years ago in Britain and in Sweden. There's a very dramatic spread, um, and it transforms life across the continent. Um, now, another dramatic feature of Europe that we can, that's documented by the archaeology, by the types of artifacts and tools that people left behind. Another dramatic transformation is this one, which is that the languages in Europe, except for a few exceptions like Basque and Hungarian and Finnish and Estonian and Sami, are all very closely related. They're in a family called Indo-European um, that is also similar closely to population to languages spoken in Armenia, Iran, and India. Um, and so that's a great mystery because those languages are not spoken in the Near East and they hardly have been spoken or have not been spoken there for 5,000 years, which we know which, because Near East was where writing was invented during this time and these the Near East had very few such languages. Hittite, ancient Hittite was an Indo-European language and was kind of an exception. So a question is, how did these great patterns come to be? And to what extent were these spreads of language and spreads of culture, uh, agricultural technology, driven by movements of people? So ancient DNA can answer the question is whether there were big movements of people. So the first ancient DNA from Europe was really focused on the transition between hunter -gathering and far hunting and gathering and farming and showed, beginning with actually not even whole genome data, but mitochondrial DNA in 2009, which is just the maternally inherited tiny sliver of your genome that's passed from mother to mother, daughter to daughter to daughter, showed that there was a really dramatic transition in Europe after farming arrived, where there was a, a near complete replacement initially of the first 
uh, of the hunter-gatherers with the farmers where the mitochondrial types change. There was an important paper in 2012 at the very beginning of the genome-wide ancient DNA revolution which showed that this happened as well um, with the whole genome data. And they estimated and they tried to make a model of present-day Europeans. These are Sardinians and Northern Europeans as a mixture of these two ancient sources, hunter-gatherers and farmers, with more farming ancestry in the south, more hunting-gatherer ancestry in the north. And they, would, they, they had a model that Europeans are a mixture of these two source populations. But there was a problem, which was in 2012, Nick Patterson, who I work with, noticed something really strange. And the thing he noticed that was really strange was that he developed a test for whether a population that he's analyzing is mixed between two other populations. And he tried this test on every population we had data from. And one population he'd had data from was a bunch of Northern European populations, like French. And the test is really, if he looks at these 600,000 positions, he can ask, are the frequencies in French, for example, do they tend to be intermediate between any other pair of populations? And he was able to show mathematically that if they tend to be intermediate on average, it provides proof positive, unambiguous evidence that this sample you're looking at, this population, the French, are mixed anciently of two groups related perhaps quite anciently and distantly to the two groups you're comparing it to and that its frequencies are intermediate to. So when he did this, he found that French are a genetic mixture of, on the one hand, a group like Sardinians, which might be a good proxy for Southern European farmers. And you might think that the other group would be some kind of population which is relatively close to early hunter-gatherers in Europe, so maybe Swedes or Lithuanians or something. But no, the best other population was Native Americans. This is a crazy, crazy result, but it was definitely real. It was Native Americans more than anybody else. And what Nick proposed was the following. He thinks that there's an ancient Southern European population that brought farming to Europe, but Europeans, Northern Europeans today, are a mixture of them and a hypothesized ancient group that we had not any data from and that doesn't exist anymore in the world, which he called the ancient North Eurasians. So he proposed a population that we didn't have any direct descendants from. And this population, in Nick's idea, was spread over Northern Eurasia, including Siberia, and sometime before 15,000 years ago had crossed the Bering Strait and contributed ancestry to people in the Americas, and people also descended from them had admixed into Europe. So he's not proposing that Native Americans migrated into Europe, but rather that there's a source population that contributed to both Europeans and to Native Americans. So this is what we call a ghost population, a population that doesn't exist anymore, but that is predicted statistically from the patterns that's left behind in present day people. So two years later, S.K. Willersled's group in Denmark found the ghost population. They were analyzing DNA from this 24,000-year-old individual in around Lake Baikal in Siberia, and they measured its genetic similarity to present-day people as shown in this heat map. Red shows a lot of similarity, and this individual is related closely to Native Americans, but not closely related at all to people who live in the region today, the indigenous Siberians, who are clearly a replacement post-Ice Age population that come in from the south. And they're also related to Europeans. So there's this dual affinity of these Maltat ancient North Eurasian samples. We have now have several other individuals from this population now in the, in the, in the world's database. Um, and it, clearly there was such an ancient North Eurasian. And once we had this data, everything fell into place. We could do much better modeling than by using Native Americans as a surrogate for it. Native Americans are a mixture of ancient North Eurasians plus an ancient East Asian population, which explains why Native Americans also have an affinity to East Asians. So how does this relate to the farming migration? Because the early models showed farmers and hunter-gatherers, and the ancient DNA samples initially revealed farming and hunter-gathering, but now we have this ancient North Eurasians. So what's going on? So here's returning to the principal component analysis. Now it's colorful, where I've colored the present-day populations or we've colored the present-day populations by the population people are a member of today. Here's Europe. Here's the Near East. Here's these Jewish and Greek populations and island Mediterranean populations. So a model of history that's consistent with the data is the following. So uh, this is a graph, and this is an African population. So we use this which, because we think it's symmetrically related to these populations, which are Eurasian, because there's an out-of-Africa migration. The first split in this graph is uh, an East Asian population or an East Asian-related population. This is an Andaman Island population. And then there's an ancient split that led on the one hand to these ancient North Eurasians and on the one other hand to the Villa Bruna cluster, this 8,000-year-old sample from Europe. They're descended from a common ancestral population that split earlier from East Asians. This model fits extremely well to the genetic data to high statistical precision. Native Americans are a mixture of these ancient North Eurasians and ancient East Asians, just like I told you before, about a third of their ancestry is from ancient North Eurasians. 
first European farmers, who we then had data from, we were able to get data from in 2014 for the first time, were a mixture of groups like these hunter-gatherers from the Villa Bruna cluster, but anciently related to them, and a group that we had new ghost population we predicted from the genetic data that we called the Basal Eurasians, which is a population that split from East Asians and West Eurasians before they separated from each other. This is a ghost population that we predict based on the data, but you haven't yet found based on ancient DNA. And that people and that Europeans today are a mixture of these three sources: these hunter-gatherers of Europe, these farmers of Europe, and these ancient North, North Eurasians in different proportions in Europe today. So the question is, as when we looked at the ancient samples from Europe um, from 5,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago, they were just a mixture of this and that and not that. So, but every, in Europe today, I will show you, Ancient North Eurasian ancestry is entirely responsible for the northward pattern here. Um, and so the, the, the upward pattern here. So they were all like down here initially. And then they ended up all up here. So there's something coming from the top of this graph that's contributing to populations today. So where did this come from? So the first clue came in 2013 with a time series from mitochondrial DNA of about 300 individuals from one little place in Germany over here, Saxony where they had nine successive archaeological cultures where they can watch these populations transforming into each other over time. And what they found is we developed a test for continuity and to see whether the mitochondrial types from one culture to the next were consistent with deriving from each other. And we found between the hunter-gatherers and the farmers, you see a green square indicating very significant discontinuity. The mitochondrial sequences are very different and are not consistent with being derived from the previous group. But after that, they're all continuous with, with each other for about two or 3,000 years. But suddenly, beginning 4,500 years ago with this culture called CWC, which is corded ware culture, there's discontinuity again. So there's a clue that something happened here with the arrival of the corded ware culture. So we followed this up with genome-wide data with uh, 94 ancient Europeans. We now have many more. <clears throat> and I'm going to walk you through in time what happened. So now I'm going to gray out the dots to be present-day people, and I'm going to start moving in from the past to the present. So the first samples we now have are these hunter-gatherers. These are European hunter-gatherers from different parts of Europe that fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. These are far eastern European hunter-gatherers that look like the correct source population for the, nor for the northern part. What happens next is the arrival of farmers, people who are genetically similar to Sardinians today, and there's a great rightward shift on this graph because there's a new migration in from the Near East that produces this population. And uh, this is a major new movement. It's a population replacement largely. But over time, over the next 2,000 years, there's a slight leftward shift, again, as these hunter-gatherers who have not completely disappeared interact with the farmers who they're living next to and mix as social barriers break down. But you still don't see populations and people like Europeans today. Meanwhile, in Far Eastern Europe, you get a mixture of a population like this and one over here that we now have in the ancient DNA data. It's related to early Iranian farmers who mixed with Eastern European steppe step people hunter-gatherers and form this group, which is called the Yamnaya. The Yamnaya are a very important archaeological culture. The Yamnaya begin spreading over the steppe 5,300 years ago. They were the first people who really moved into the open steppe grasslands away from the river. And this was possible by two inventions that had not existed before. One was the invention of the wheel, which had happened earlier, not by them, but they adopted it. And it allowed them to uh, have carts that they could use to take supplies onto the steppe. And the other was the domestication of the horse, which had just happened earlier. With their horses and their wheels, they moved into the steppe. And they moved into places where never people had uh, exploited before and were able to graze their animals on horseback, taking supplies into the steppe. They experienced vast population expansions. At this time in archaeology, settlements completely disappear because these people were living in mobile homes. All we see is their graves, which are very dramatic and rich. They spread very dramatically beginning 5,300 years ago from the initial location, which probably is a step north of the Black and Caspian Seas. They went all the way east to Mongolia. They went all the way west to parts of to Europe and Hungary. They expanded very dramatically, expanding and spreading a relatively homogeneous genetic culture, and we also see genetically, genetically homogeneous as well as culturally relatively homogeneous. So beginning 4,500 years ago, suddenly this appears, and it's after the Yamnaya expansion into Europe, which then becomes another pop, uh, cultural expansion called the Corded Ware, which we can show is directly derived from the Yamnaya. <clears throat> 
And so here's a summary of what we see. So these orange bars represent farming ancestry. Initially, it's near 100% after the farmers arrive. There's a resurgence of hunter-gatherer ancestry as the farmers mix with hunter-gatherers who are still there. And then suddenly, this green type of ancestry arrives, which is ubiquitous in Europe today. Um, and it arrives 4,500 years ago. It's the single most important component in Europe, and it's coming from the steppe. That friendly looking guy at the beginning of my talk with the big mace is one of these Yamnaya individuals who contributed a lot of ancestry uh, to these people. So the final chapter, which will be the shortest chapter here, is about uh, the latest work that we've been doing, which is trying to follow the steppe expansion uh, west. So these, as, as I mentioned to you, these Yamnaya expanded beginning 5300, and then they entered, they contributed most of the ancestry, 70% of the ancestry of the corded ware culture people who arrive in Germany um, by about 4,500 years ago. While the corded ware expan culture is expanding in Eastern Europe, at the same time, there's a very dramatic expansion of a metalworking culture who made these beautiful pots that are called beakers, or bell beakers, in Western Europe, um, beginning first in Spain, beginning about 4,800 years ago. And these two great cultural expansions meet in Central Europe. Um, and it's always been a mystery what occurred. So we've collected quite a lot of data from these individuals from all of these places where these people who made beakers were. And we see two really interesting phenomena. We also collected a lot of British samples from before and after. And what you see is that the people who made these beakers were genetically not all the same. So unlike the Yamnayad, who are genetically very similar to each other, and unlike the corded ware, who are genetically very similar to each other, the beaker individual, the people buried with beaker pottery fell into two clusters. The Spanish ones, who are genetically very dissimilar to the uh, Central European and British ones. And what this is showing you is that this way of making beaker pottery and all of the other artifacts associated with the culture was spreading by communication of ideas, kind of like we have cell phones and we communicate them to people of different cultures even though we're not genetically related. This is what was happening with this beaker phenomenon. It's the kind of ancient religion you see actually at some sites in our data, even in Hungary, for example, and in southern France, two individuals buried side by side, one entirely ancestry like this, one entirely ancestry like this. So these were, this was a multi-ethnic culture which was incorporating people that were genetically very different from each other. So uh, in Britain though, instead of it being multi-ethnic, with the arrival of the beakers, which happens about 2350, it's very precisely dated in Britain, Here's the people before the beakers. Suddenly, uh, here's the Dutch beakers. Suddenly, all the British beakers are like this. There's a rapid and sudden and complete transformation in Britain of the ancestry of all the samples. And so far, we haven't found an exception. We have many dozens of samples. It looks like a 90% population replacement replacement in Britain, only a one or 200 years after the arrival of steppe ancestry in Central Europe. And so this Yamnaya ancestry rolled west to Central Europe, largely replaced the population of Central Europe, and then came to uh, Britain and largely replaced the population there. So the Stonehenge was largely built, but not completely built at the time. The beakers that got there, they finished building it, but they're genetically very different. They're a replacement population that replaced the population that built these monuments. And there's a, if you look at the Y chromosome types that are inherited on the male line, there's a very dramatic change. So I want to conclude by talking about that there's, uh, most of the data I've told you about is really about, uh, from uh, earlier than 4,000 years ago, and there's a gap between then and the present. How does the populations of the past that we're beginning to learn about, for example, in Europe, connect to the present? And that relies on looking at the Late Bronze Age, at the Iron Age, at the Roman period, and the Hellenistic period in Europe, for example, and equally important questions in many other places. And it's like a highway finish in midair that never, that, that's not complete. I remember when I was a kid, we used to drive up from Washington, D.C., where I grew up to, to New York, and on the way we would go through Baltimore, and there was this unfinished highway in midair, and it's always left this huge impression on me, um, and it, it never was finished. Um, and it, and um, so um, this one's in South Africa, and um, and uh, that I found on the web. So a problem, though, of connecting the past to the present is by the Baker period, genetically, the people from the time, as you know from the principal component analysis plot, are very similar to people who live today. They're genetically falling in the same position. And so it's hard to differentiate them. And the methods that we and others develop for studying Neanderthals and, and other archaic humans and very big dramatic changes are not going to work as well because these populations are, in terms of their ingredients, similar. We need more sensitive techniques. But luckily, with large sample sizes, it's possible to figure out detailed population structure. So this is a method using the types of techniques that have been used in the ancient DNA community, studying about 2,000 people from Britain, 
and trying to cluster them, and it can't do much in terms of clustering them. Maybe it can find Orkney being different from the other groups or parts of Wales, but it's not very good. But with these more sensitive methods, you can begin to cluster in precision uh, populations. And I think there's a lot of promise with big sample sizes, because these methods require big sample sizes to extend ancient DNA to the present, and the technology now makes it possible to go forward. So the conclusions that I wanted to leave you with is that ancient DNA studies have been transformative already, just in the first few years and changing our understanding of the past. And the technology is going through an exponential growth phase. It's very Eurocentric right now, not because Europe is more important than other places, but just because it's where these techniques were first developed and applied. Um, and I think we have an opportunity, really, as a community to build an at atlas of human genome diversity. It's kind of like for what it was like for Europeans in the uh, 15th through the 19th century to sail their ships to places where P Europeans had never been before and find things about the world that had been never known before. We really can look at p times in the past when we haven't looked at before as a, as a scholarly community and try to understand how they relate to each other and to the present. And our experience has been that every time we've done that, we've been surprised that our assumptions from archaeology and from history have been wrong in pretty fundamental and powerful ways. And it's really exciting to be part of this um, now. So I guess there's, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. Even by the standards of human genetics, I think it's been truly amazing to see how technology has transformed this space uh, so quickly over the, over the last five years. So I'd like to open the floor for questions. I, I would ask anyone who has a question, if they could, to file up. There's two microphones here at the front of the room, one on the left-hand side, one on the right-hand side. Um, it's, it's easier for the people who are, are viewing this remotely to hear the questions if you, if you speak through the microphones. And while I wait to see if anyone is brave enough to step up forward to the microphones, I was wondering, I was wondering if I could ask about the, obviously, as, you, as this DNA information has come through, it's often conflicted with the picture of history that's emerged from archaeology. And I was wondering how that interaction has occurred. As you, as you and your colleagues have changed the way that we think about the peopling of, of these various continents in ways that really doesn't fit the standard model, how has that interaction with archaeologists who are so dependent on physical remains gone? Have they been receptive to these new approaches? Has there been conflict between the two groups? And how has this played out? I, I think that's a great question. So archaeologists are scientists. They are deeply mm -hmm. interested in trying to figure out and understand the past. And they are a community that has embraced science as a way of learning about the past again and again and again and again. And so an analogy to what's going on right here is what was called the radiocarbon revolution. So beginning in 1949, someone named Willard Libby figured out that you could obtain the absolute date of a sample by measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 isotopes in a sample. And that established an absolute chronology for the past and overthrew many previous assumptions about the past because, for example, it was shown that large monuments, stone monuments, were not invented in the Near East, in Egypt and Mesopotamia. They were rather invented, first appeared in Western Europe and places like Stonehenge and so on. And so whole chronologies of all civilization and all inventions coming from the East and uh, time scales were all changed. And archaeologists have embraced the innovations from science again and again and are embracing this one. I think there's a particular sensitivity here in genetics because what we're talking about are movements of people and that's politically very um, caught up in the difficulties of the 20th century because uh, the beginnings of archaeology, there were people who identified groups like the culture, corded ware culture, for example, uh, of Eastern Europe as the founders of Indo-European languages. They spread across Eastern Europe. There were German archaeologists uh, who argued that they were the people who originated Indo-European languages. They spread in all directions. Their homeland was in Germany and in nearby places, and they entitled this, these were the original Aryans, and people, uh, and the, the, this is the natural homeland of Germany, and it was used as part of the propaganda um, justification for claims on territory that was used in the Second World War. So after the Second World War, um, the archaeological and anthropological community reacted very strongly to this by arguing and picking apart, as academics do, the arguments that were used to, to say that these were migrations of the Corded Ware people and to show problems with those arguments. And it became very unpopular in archaeology and still is, actually, in a lot of places to claim migration. The assumption is, is that changes in culture happen through communication of ideas, not movement of people. And the genetics has started to find cases like the Corded Ware expansion, but although it's in the opposite direction to the way those uh, archaeologists at the beginning of the 20th century said, it's from the east to the west rather than the west to the east. Um, the 
uh, it's showing that migration is actually quite profoundly important in human history, as well as admixture. And so I think that it's really interesting to contend with this. On some of the papers I've been involved, one example when we were involved in this discovery of this major expansion from the steppe into Central Europe, one German archaeologist wrote to all the co-authors of our paper. He said, this is like the settlement archaeology of Gustav Kossena at the beginning of the 20th century. We can't be part of something that revives this even a little bit. And he dropped off the paper. And all these archaeologists started like resigning from the paper. And so we had to like revise the paper. And then they all came back on the paper. But it's a very <laughs> sensitive, it's a, it's a very sensitive issue. And uh, appropriately sensitive. There's this question in, in archaeology, this pots versus people debate. when cultures change as it due to communications of ideas or migrations, and we can answer that for the first time with genetic data. People were trying to answer it before by skull shapes, and it wasn't, it wasn't adequate, and there were too many problems with it. But you can answer it now. It's, it's an answerable question. Great. Thank you. We have a question on the left here. Yes. Um, in the popularity now of, going, of being able to do your own DNA and finding out where you are, how far back can you go in that DNA to find out, like, it, can you go back to the ancient DNA? Like we, we did our ancestry DNA and found out, you know, we're just a multiple of different, mm -hmm. you know, from different continents and everything like that. So with technology, how far back now can you go in your own ancestry through the DNA that is taken from, from us today? So the question is how do you, how far, uh, how far can you extend personal ancestry testing and connect to these ancient peoples? And the answer is you probably can find relatives back a few thousand years um, if someone's related to you. Um, and uh, you probably can, in principle, connect your DNA to these ancient populations that are defined based on the ancient DNA. That connection is not yet made by these companies. Um, they're not developing the tools to do that right now, but that's something that in principle can happen. For my part, my personal feeling is that I'm very bored with my own DNA. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I am from an overstudied group, um, and the genetics of diff other people from my group will be just as interesting as my own, and I might as well study a more interesting group than my own. So <laughs> that is kind of a perspective that I have. And so I actually think that trying to learn about the world from your own perspective of your genome limits you in terms of your ability to conceive of the world around you. So I think it's very exciting to think about how your genome is related to the genome of other people. But at some point, I think I would advocate that you should make a jump and try to hold it all in your head and somehow <laughs> think about how I connect to this matrix and then try to understand the matrix. That's the best way to do it, rather than to try to see how far you can push your own family tree. Yeah. That's, a, that's a thought. It's not. It's a personal it's, view. Because it's so dynamic, our, our matrix of yeah. In, in ours. It's really yeah. all around the world. Yeah. If you so go it's back, very exciting. If you go back 20 generations, you have a million ancestors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great. Question on the right. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. My name is Ben, and I'm just going to follow up from, from that question. Uh, with the uh, for-profit uh, personalized information companies that will analyze your DNA, what do you think are some m aspects of misinformation, either intentional or unintentional, that the lay public may be getting from these uh, personal data sets that they're supplied with. And a second question, um, how, how far advanced is the technology of extracting DNA from historic sites? It seems like uh, that the newer technology is finding new insights to extract historically very old DNA. How far along is that? And do you think there'll be further significant breakthroughs in time? Okay, so I'll answer the first question, second question first. So the second question is, is will there be additional breakthroughs? There's been, break, there's been a series of breakthroughs, mostly in Germany in this laboratory in Leipzig, to make the conversion of skeletal remains to DNA more efficient by orders of magnitude. And those have been hugely powerful. There's been recognition of which skeletal types to look at. Um, and there's been uh, this enrichment process. I think that those are three very important developments that together have made this whole process possible. And I think that um, further developments in those directions, and perhaps some unanticipated, will continue to make this even more efficient and powerful. Um, uh, and so I anticipate that the success rates will continue to become higher and that there will be other major improvements going forward. I mean, the, the fact is we can now actually regularly obtain DNA from many of these samples at reasonable cost, but it will get even better and better over the coming years. Your first question was about 
possible misuse of personal ancestry testing results. And I think that both the users of these personal ancestry testing results, you, um, if you take one of these tests, and the companies that purvey them to you, both have an incentive to know something interesting, find something interesting. And it's actually a dangerous situation from a scientific point of view. So one example of this that I find particularly frustrating is the series of companies that have sprung up around trying to uh, provide information about ancestry to African Americans, which is a community that's, lost, that's had its roots forcibly taken from it in the slave trade. And companies provide information like, you are from such and such a tribe uh, in such and such a place. And people have gotten very excited about this, as African Americans are often interested in their roots. And that information cannot be reliably provided based on genetic data. And yet people will pay money for it. And therefore, companies will provide this information. They'll provide people with a certificate or information like this. So that's one egregious example of it, but it's still going on. And people are excited about this and talk about this. But the more interesting information one of these companies can provide to you, the more you're likely to be interested in it. So there's just a natural danger in this. Same thing with the Neanderthal ancestry proportion. The information that these companies are providing you about your Neanderthal ancestry proportion is essentially meaningless. Um, because they're saying, oh, you're in the top 5% or 3% or lowest 2% of Neanderthal ancestry for a European. But those estimates are all statistically in the noise. Um, and in fact, that estimate that's as it's being done is far more uncertain than the actual variation in the population of the proportion of Neanderthal ancestry. So you really are just being sold junk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On that depressing note, next question. Um, so you mentioned a couple kind of replacement events, population replacements, and I was just curious if you had any insight into the nature of those replacement events as if, you know, maybe a pandemic or something like that, or was it, you know, just the genes were bred out, or what was the nature? So in a, uh, the question was, what is the nature of these population replacement events? That's a fantastic question, because, for example, in this arrival of the corded ware in Central Europe 4,500 years ago, this was a pastoralist population or derived from pastoralist populations that relied on herding, and it was coming into a densely settled agricultural place which had a higher population density, how did it achieve a 70% population replacement or more? Um, how do you have such a big population replacement? Um, and um, archaeologists before this work argued that you can't have that big a population replacement once farming is established in a place. Same sorts of arguments apply to India, where there's hugely dense farming populations. How can you make a major impact on the outside? And yet it happened in Europe. And one really amazing paper that came out, not from our group, in the year after this discovery of this replacement in Central Europe, was this group analyzed the ancient DNA from the 101 individuals. They analyzed mostly from the steppe from this period. And they analyzed the DNA not for human DNA, but for pathogen DNA. And they found in seven of the 101 individuals, their teeth, they found the plague pathogen, Yersinia pestis, the black death pathogen. That's a huge fraction, because it meant that they found in about 7% of their samples, they found black death. If people die with black death in their teeth, that means they died probably of the black death, um, because you're, you shouldn't be bacteremic when you die. And probably the method doesn't detect everybody who had it, died, it. So this, died of it. So it's a huge fraction of random burials having this plague. So one possibility that was suggested very tentatively and carefully in this paper was the possibility that the Black Death, was, which was not thought to have jumped into humans before 2,000 or even 700 years ago, before this, that the Black Death was endemic in the steppe uh, by these people who were living side by side with their horses and sheep and cattle, but that Europeans were naive farmers, and that these steppe people start coming in, and there's an epidemic coming from the steppe. And it's like the Americas being exposed to the epidemics from Europe, where it's been sort of kind of a reversal. It's always thought and argued that, oh, Europeans have always been living right next to their horses and cattle and sheep and goats and so on. And you know we're all prepped with all these resistance to disease. They come to the Americas, and there's this big wipeout. But maybe that happened in Europe, too, and maybe it cleared the way for these people. So that's sort of an idea about how pathogens could have potentially cleared the way. There's other ideas, too. That seems and, most um, logical to me. Yeah. So I think we may have time for one more quick question. I don't know if someone wants to. OK, maybe two more quick questions. Fine, since someone's uh, I think you were waiting here first. Do you have? Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, my question is, is with regards to the ghost population and other similar populations. Uh, how much of that similarity would you attribute to random evolutionary convergence as opposed to admixture and migration and therefore inheritance? Sorry, the, the, is the question just correct? 
clarify to me, your question is how much is the similarity or dissimilarity of populations that you see in the world today mm -hmm. due to random evolutionary fluctuation uh, compared to convergence through mixture? I think that's your question. Uh, do they evolve separately, independent of each other, and reach a point of convergence where they're similar uh, as with um, high altitude genes? Um, as opposed to admixture and therefore inheriting those. So, so populations of all living things go through a tug of war between divergence and convergence. The divergence happens because um, random changes accumulate over time as well as some under the pressure of natural selection like the ones you mentioned. And convergence happens due to mixture or perhaps dying off of certain groups. And I think we're seeing that balance here. One of the lessons from the genome-wide ancient DNA revolution has been that population mixture, at least in humans, has been a recurrent theme in history. If you think, people, I think, like to think, Luca cavalli sforza like to think that the last 500 years associated with transatlantic travel are unusual times in our history. There are periods when, because people were moving further, you have massive mixtures of groups like Africans and Europeans or Native Americans, Europeans and Africans producing unprecedented mixtures. But in fact, we now know that's not true. In fact, there have been equally profound mixtures at many, many time depths in history. For example, in India, two to 4,000 years ago, there's mixtures of groups just as differentiated as the ones that mixed in the Americas and that form the groups that live in India today. And there's mixtures of Neanderthals and modern humans and there's mixtures of these groups I told you about in West Eurasia. And it's again and again and again. We find many, many examples of it and we only we don't know the tiniest fraction of it. So I think that mixture and bringing people back together is also an important process in humans. So we've reached the end. So I'll ask people who still have questions to come up and talk to David afterwards. I have some bad news and good news. The bad news is while we were sitting in here, there was a tremendous thunderstorm outside, which has resulted in a fair bit of water hanging around out there. So you may want to loiter for a while before you leave. The good news is we have refreshments outside, so you can eat <laughs> and drink while you wait. Please join me in thanking David.